long hair, large lures, Velcro shoes, and my main musky man himself, Pete Mena. This week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all. Here we go. Welcome to another edition of Mercer, the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast. Thank you for spending Wednesday with us. Happy hump day to all you humpers. And thank you for your unbelievable support. Week after week, this podcast, this channel gets bigger and bigger. And it's because of you guys. And I thank you for that. Um, in a crazy time where where it seems like the only way you can survive on the internet is to be controversial and make every show dum, dum, dum. we have tried to do not that we are trying to do it with positivity happiness and we do it because of you guys and that's how it stays positive and happy but this is a special wednesday and let's have a look at what it is it is not just any wednesday this is national meteor day national sorry national meteor watch day this is also national social media day national Outfit of the day day. So no matter what one of those you're celebrating, we thank you for coming here to Mercer, the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast. It's hard to believe, but this is show 13. It's supposed to be bad luck, but it's going to be good luck because we're doing something special. You guys know this podcast is just a bizarre conversation of awkward conversations that I have with friends of mine in the fishing world. And the fishing world is so much bigger than just bass fishing. So this week, I've decided to bring in an absolute hammer from outside of the bass world. And this guy is a long-haired, freaky person that I absolutely love. I mean, he is a crazy critter that has accomplished an incredible amount in this support, in this support or sport. Um, and the thing that I love most about him is, I mean, you hang out with him and he is like your best buddy. You know, you just have a lot of laughs. You just enjoy yourself. And you're driving home from said hangout. And you start thinking about who he is and what he's done in the musky world and what he's done in the fishing world and the Hall of Famer that he is and the amazing individual he is. And you just, you, I mean, you because he's so cool and so chill, you forget about all that. But man, this is an amazing, an amazing dude. And I'm proud to call him my friend. And if he's my friend, he's 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 your friend, and and which makes him a friend of the show, which makes him this week's guest. And I'd like to bring him in right now. Without further ado, the one and only Pete Mayno. One of the best parts about me doing this podcast for me personally is this: the excuse to catch up with really good friends that literally life just gets really busy and we don't get to see each other that much. Pete Mayno, thank you very much for doing this. And how in the world are you? I'm great, sir. And, you know, your little comments there are absolutely true. We do all get too busy. And, boy, it's been a while since we've talked. Really has. Hey, sure have has. you been fishing some toothies? I mean, you know, to any large degree since we last fished? Uh, pike. I did some pike stuff. Um, yeah, I saw the pike stuff. Uh, how about how about those those nasty muskies? Have you fished those? Well, I, I I thought I was being a true friend to you. I mean, you've chosen the muskalunge to be your 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 path in this industry, <laughs> and and I don't want to tread all over your path. Right. I mean, I, I only musky fish with the best, and, and you're kind of one of the best. So, no, I haven't done a musky show since we talked or since we did one i mean I, I think i've tried but they sucked um it yeah, which which you. is leads me to my first question of our little conversation today the fact that you fish for a living doesn't shock me uh, i mean your 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 past kind of led you to it you're very similar to me you never really had a real real job you know what i mean you started guiding at a very very young age but why do why musky like well you, there's so many other species why musky? I, I ask myself that <laughs> quite often for several decades now. Uh, I, I don't understand because especially when I'm doing, uh, trying to get a TV show and nothing's working. And I wonder to myself, gosh, if I was fishing bass or walleye or something, you know, 
I'd probably be catching some right now, but now I'm sitting here worrying. I haven't seen a muskie in four hours, six hours, whatever it might be. I'm like, why do I do this to myself? But I just, uh, I, I don't know, Dave, they, you know, they got my heart right away, I guess. And, and stubborn and stupid. I mean, there's no other explanation to it. You, you get after them. I will say this in fresh water. They, they still scare me when they come out of nowhere and yeah. the longer the period of them sucking prior. So you haven't seen one for hours and hours. You hate yourself. You're supposed to be an expert, but you're telling yourself you can't possibly be an expert. You're probably never going to catch another one. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, one comes, grabs your bait, and then all of a sudden you're smart and you think muskies are semi-cool for a very short period. Was it always musky for you, though? Like, do you think, like, I know for me, bass, even before I caught a lot of bass, bass were... Um, I just there's there's an attraction between me and that fish for whatever reason I can't explain it. Was it always musky for you? Like, what, was it plain and simple? Like, has nobody shocked to see what you do for a living? Oh, now you're getting right down to the core. But in reality, I have always fished for everything and actually really enjoyed everything. But I I would I would say it has more to do with ego than anything. I had the <laughs> I had built up my guide business uh, by the time I was 17, 18, already to the point of basically having all I needed. And I just personally got into the muskie. I'm like, I got to catch more of these than any other living humanoid, upright walking being on earth. And, and I just kind of transferred that to my guiding after a while because I could. And I'm no longer that way. I spend a lot more time now fishing other species than I did, but I literally went through the, uh, basically a decade stretch there where it was musky only period. And the average day on the water was 16 hours every day. And that's just what I did. And, you know, you, you, I, I can say I got out of control. It was somewhat uh, addictive to a certain extent, but that's what kind of got me down the road and got me known as the musky guy too, even though in reality, all the way through, I've fished all species, and I've ice fished since I could stand on the ice and all of that stuff. But, uh, yeah, the musky thing really got me there for a little while. People use that word a lot, addiction, you know, when it comes to musky. And even the guys who are chasing a, a new world record bass, like somebody who's trying to catch something that just isn't average, um, it just isn't, you know, something that you can do routinely they use the word addiction. How bad did your addiction get? Well, it was bad. I mean, when I wrote the first Musky Suck book, I mean, that was basically about that period of time where I was really addicted. And when I write in there, that book, it, it was a lot of fun because I was, you know, you're used to writing how to and all this serious stuff. And uh, that the whole idea behind that was to be funny to a certain extent, but also tell the truth realistically. And and you do, I, I was, I was addicted to the point where, you know, more or less nothing else mattered. And to a certain extent, when I write about, you didn't have time for friends, you didn't, I mean, the social life went away. It was like, if I was awake, I had to be fishing. There were, you know, I, I'd come home from a, a, a full day and then a half day guiding, and I'd be seeing deer running around on the way home. And I'm like, these fish are still active. I'd be like, <laughs> I got to go put the boat back in the water and go fit. You know, that's, that's really the way I was for a long period of time. And frankly, you know, you see that that's, that that's why I did well was just stubbornness. It is really at the end of the day, when you're spending that many hours on the water, you're going to, you're going to catch them. Right. And you're ultimately during that period, the best at patterning them because you're literally out there all hours of the day on, on bodies of water and you know where they are and you know what they're reacting to. And, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to do that again to that level. I don't know that physically I could, but frankly, it's, uh, it is interesting how dialed you can get. And, you know, when you're out that much and you can is catch there is there a trait with you weirdos? Like there, there's a group of you weirdos that, that, that cross this land searching for giant muskies. Is there a trait? Like, have you, you've, I mean, they, they, 
the amount of when you mentioned your name around musky anglers, the amount of reverence that is thrown around your name, but you've spent a lot of time with a lot of these guys. And is there a trait where you're like, we're all kind of this way? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I, I think it affects other rabbit anglers that get into bass or walleye. I, I've got real good friends that they're main species walleye, which I personally But you catch know. walleye and bass. I mean, yeah, you, you, there's not often days you go fishing for walleye and bass and you come back and you're like, yep, I I, I had a follow. <laughs> like you, you, other sport, other species like bass and walleye, nobody's like, I didn't catch anything today, but I had three follows. I mean, when you start catching follows, when you start counting follows, you know that, that, that I mean, only two groups do it: musky anglers and fly anglers. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's true. But yeah, but that's that's an advantage. We can count follows. Oh, and misses. okay. So we've still got something to talk about, even if we don't catch anything. So there's gotcha. an advantage there. And then, Dave, if you go out and get skunked. There's no other species where that's really okay. With muskies, it's still okay. It's a little hard on the ego, but it's not that bad to say, well, we, we saw 10 and we missed one and, you know, we didn't catch anything. That's still acceptable. If you do that bass fishing, they laugh at you, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they do. And then you, before you know it, you're hosting a podcast and emceeing tournaments <laughs> and hardly even fishing at all. <laughs> Uh, no, but you know, Pete, I've always found it, 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 I mean, I find it amazing about you, but I also find it so intriguing to see that, I mean, literally when I look at our, our lives, I mean, you started guiding, I think at 11 or 12 years old or something like that. I started guiding at like 13, 14 years old. Like we both have very similar where I don't know about you, but for me, the thought of just a regular job cross threads my brain. I mean, it wasn't really, I never thought, man, I'm a good enough angler to do this. I just realized that I'm not good at that other stuff enough and I need to be doing this. Uh, what's your theory on how you ended up where you are? Uh, just that, that same stubbornness that wires people to fish muskies, I think in the first place. I mean, I had a lot of people trying to steer me the right direction. I actually did pretty well in high school, uh, and I was supposed to go to college. Everybody told me I was going to starve to death if I didn't, and I I made that decision pretty early on that I didn't really need to do that, that I could, you know, go guiding, and I, I distinctly remember the door, the driver's door on my truck literally falling off from rust at a boat landing one day, and I was starting to wonder at that point if I, you know, maybe made a mistake but uh no you just stubborn with it and you know you you make it work because you I, I really couldn't see not guiding and not musk yeah. wishing at that point there was just nothing else acceptable and real quickly one of my the guy that's turned into one of my best fishing buddies is christian leitner and when it's interesting, his story, his, uh, when he was with the Minnesota Timberwolves, the strength and conditioning coach there invited him to go up to Lake of the Woods where he had a cabin. And obviously somebody that, that gets to that level in sports as well has to be, you know, that type of person that really makes their mind up they're going to be good at something, right? Yeah. And anyway, long story short, he went up to Lake of the Woods. He went musky. He didn't even catch one. I think he had a follow. I forget the exact story, but he has been absolutely addicted ever since. And when you fish with Christian Leitner, if you even bring up basketball, he doesn't even talk. He doesn't even want to, he just keeps casting. Now you start talking muskies, can't shut him up. But, you know, people, there, there are certain people that are just wired that way when they try it. And of course, there's a lot of smart people too. There's quite a few that go out musky fishing like you. You were able to do it. Yeah. You actually, you actually saw them caught. You caught one, you know, yeah. I mean, it so, and you didn't just fall right into it. Some people try it and they're able to just turn up their nose at it and go about their life and they do well with it. But some of us can't, we just can't ignore it. I guess. Hmm? I, I, has there been a, any fish in your life that, you know, what, it, I mean, of all the musk you've caught, what are the ones that stand out? Like, is there any that stand out above all other? And, and is it, or is it just as simple as the biggest one's the one that stands out? 
No, I'm more, I'm actually more into the way things uh, go down. Sometimes the, than actual size. Uh, if you, if you have a, a real tough period, then all of a sudden things start happening. Or I have, I have a million stories I could tell you where, especially night fishing, where I had things really dialed in where I could literally say, okay, I think something's going to happen on this next spot. And if something happens on this next spot, I'm going to take you here, 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 and here. And it all just works out perfectly. And those are, of course, you, you never want to tell the stories where the stuff doesn't work out perfectly. But when it, <laughs> it is, it is kind of neat when you get things dialed like that and you, and you get a series of fish and basically things go down like that. Very honestly, one of the biggest muskies I ever caught was that one with you. Yeah. It was someone over there. I mean, and, and that was just an amazing day just because those fish seemed not only were they pretty fired up and we had a lot of action, I think you probably remember the first one when I was trying to look like Mr. TV star, I hooked it about a million miles out there and it basically yanked me into the middle of your boat, <laughs> bruised my shin, bruised my ego and everything. But they were just, they were really fired up that day. And if you remember that big one, I think it jumped like four times. It was just all over the place. So those, those are the kind of memories, but I'm not, I'm not all that hung up on the, on the biggest ones. It's just, you know, the way things go down and the way things come together. I like, I like telling those stories really. Those are the best memories. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, that, that day was amazing. And that day really to me explained why, why you're a good muskie angler. Cause if you, if you remember for the first three, four hours of the day, and we were fishing Lake St. Clair, we didn't get, we didn't had nothing. And we're throwing these big giant things. And I mean, I had to get rotator cuff surgery right after the shoot, basically. Um, but, but I remember we were three, four hours into this and I'm like, Pete, if we don't catch a muskie soon, I'm going to throw a tube jig, hook a bass and we'll <laughs> find a muskie. Cause that is the best pattern on Lake St. Clair. Well, you ended up hooking one. And I think we caught like 14 fish that day. It, it, it was unbelievable. You know, the best muskie day that I've ever had, but, but a guy like me would have, would, would have given up on him so much sooner. Speaking of giving up, do, do you, I would think as a guy who's done everything that you've done in the musky world, every once in a while, you'd maybe hate bass or walleye. Like, I mean, you've been to things like you go to ICAST and you see all the hoopla around bass. Do, do, every once in a while, do you want to just grab people and be like, listen, musky is the king. <laughs> oh Yeah. I'd like to, but you know, I'd lose a lot of friends probably. <laughs> that. You can't just grab people and shake them at ICAST. You know what I'm saying? But there are, you I've know, seen some guys shake some people down at <laughs> ICAST. <laughs> it's definitely true to a certain extent. I think everybody's got those things. It's like if, if you see the all of the focus on bass or something else, you're like, well, well, why aren't these fish getting more attention? They're tougher to catch. You got to be a bigger hard head and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, it's, uh, I'm also well aware that it's, it's people's passion. And, and obviously I don't know if the, they'll ever turn this whole bass thing around. So you can wish all you want, but I mean, that's, I think it's going to remain unless of course the fishery somehow got completely depleted. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's ever going to turn that around with the popularity of bass. You know, they're, they are a blast and they're, you know, they're all over the continent. And, uh, you know, I don't admit it to musky guys generally, but uh, I do enjoy fishing. What, what, say that again. What, I think we froze. What, what, what did you say? You would... I, I, I think I kind of said I actually like fishing for bass at times. Wow. That, that at, at times. At times. Yeah. At, when are those times? <laughs> when the muskies aren't biting. I, I gotta, I gotta be honest this spring. Uh, I, I, my, my, uh, dad's younger brother came up for two weeks and they don't really like to fish musky all that much. So we're fishing bass and walleye all the time. Yeah. Dad, dad can't cast real well anymore either. So I, there was a certain relief. I have to be perfect, perfectly honest after the musky season opened. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to get the fish muskies much, but at least I'm going to catch a lot of fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be so tough. 
<laughs> and we had a great time. But but it does, you know, it's still there, you know. You're like, oh, all of a sudden the weather would roll through and we were bass or walleye fishing, and it'd be like, I should be pitching a big bait. We should go, <laughs> we should go trolling or we should be musky fishing somehow right now. Talk talk to me about those big bizarre baits. Because as a bass angler, as a you know, not a musky specific angler, every time I go musky fishing, I mean I just look at it seems like they get more and more bizarre and bigger and, and stranger. Is that, does, does it make a musky cooler if you catch it on something that's this long and it's pink and has fur and spinny things and lasers? It is, <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy stuff. And, and a lot of it has gotten bigger and, but realistically i i don't know to what level fish learn i'm absolutely certain you ponder the same thing yeah. but in reality that's what it's all about and uh and and i have to say an older guy like me is a little disadvantaged these days because i don't want to throw those one pound soft plastic <laughs> deals that are out there now but i have seen times basically the whole thing is finding something different if you can possibly find different patterns, different spots, things that are, you find, find fish that aren't seen as many baits. And then more importantly, with the pressured fish, you know, with regard to the simple bait topic, show them something they haven't seen a whole bunch of. And, and that's why I think you see all these crazy variants. And, and, and there's, there's actually no doubt about it. If, if you can come up with something they haven't seen a whole lot of, I've, I've just seen it too many times, story after story. Actually, yesterday, uh, testing a new bait. I mean, uh, that really had this something. My, my buddy that I gave it to said, well, there's really nothing quite like this out there, you know, on that size of bait. And I'll be darned if I didn't just kind of watch him in the front of the boat have all the action and I was throwing some more normal things in the back. And so it, it can definitely make a difference. So that's why you see all these crazy things with fur and spinners and, and soft plastics, soft plastics have expanded probably the most in the last yeah. decade in the musky arena and all different shapes and sizes and, and stuff. You, you literally need specialized equipment, extra heavy rods to even throw this stuff. And it does help to be 20. Does this work? <laughs> Does long hair help? Because that, that has been your stereotype. And, and it seems to, you have had long hair long enough that it was in style, out of style. And I think it's back, Pete. I, I It's absolutely back. I mean, I am getting a lot of compliments on my mullet. I mean, lately, everybody's telling me I got a hashtag mullet and, and do this. So I might, I might have to get into that. I could maybe claim I was the originator, definitely not the originator of the mullet, but maybe the musky mullet. You know what I'm saying? I think you you lay strong claim to be in the original mullet in, in pro fishing, maybe even. Like, I'm trying to think of what, what mullets preceded you, Pete. I mean, well, Peter Frampton? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> really that's it. A real good point. It's... Uh, it's one but of my favorite but parts. But it's branding. I gotta, I gotta tell you quickly though. I, I, I will say I remember I'm 16, 17 years old, doing, doing pretty good on the musky stuff. And I remember on a real calm day, it was about the third time I heard it, and it snapped in my head. Hear another boat driving by saying, "You see that guy over there with the long blonde hair? That's Pete Mena." And I thought to myself, you know what? That long blonde hair, I should probably keep that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of your tea, you know. The tea on top of Bill Dance's hat is yep. your hair, you know. That that people are synonymous with that. Um, but I'm going to give you what is called a hot take, Pete. Uh, do you know what a hot take is? No, but I'm going to find out. I got a feeling. It probably, yeah. Um, a hot take is generally when say, I mean, sports shows do them. A lot of people do them. A hot take is something. It's an opinion that that may be factual or not, but I'm going to give you a, a hot take. Generally, it's the opposite opinion that most people think. Um, so I'm going to give you a hot take on musky fishing. They are the most overhyped fish on earth. I mean, you guys talk about them like they are this apex predator, the toughest fish ever. You need a reel the size of your head. You need a lure the size of your freaking thigh you need to throw this out blow your rotator cuff up you catch this fish you battle the mighty beast 
you put it back in the water. And if you don't spend 45 minutes reviving it, it goes. So my hot take is muskies do suck. They're not near as tough as people have made them to seem. And Pete Maynard, you're part of the problem. <laughs> I'm you glad part of the problem? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I see the enemy in the mirror every morning. You could be right. Yeah. Are they overhyped though? Do you think there is a certain muskie? Because as a bass angler, they seem a little overhyped at times. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I I guess there's a little hype there. You can the disagree, Pete. You, you can disagree. I mean, you you don't have to be nice. You, you wouldn't be nice if I wasn't recording this. You would say bad oh, things to can. me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always have that little thing. Everything else is just bait we can fall back on. And by the way, I heard of, uh, I was filming here a couple of weeks ago, and this uh, young cameraman fellow that was in the boat was talking to me about a particular pattern where in July, the muskies start chasing every largemouth bass what? that they hook. Yes, so I explain the simple solution to them. The only problem is it's in the wrong state. It's in the state of Minnesota where you can't legally use a game fish for bait. But if this would occur in the state of Wisconsin, if it's actually a legal fish captured out of the body of water you're fishing, I could turn around and put that on a quick strike rig and use it as musky bait. And the way he described this pattern, I thought it was absolutely brilliant to do that during this time period over so what would you as a bass guy think about that if we you know legalized using largemouth bass for musky angling do you think that would be something that you know should be legalized and that you'd like to try well uh, no no you not at all chuck those baits dave but hey but oh, here's bait what's... chucking just watch the bobber man here's what's gonna happen i mean your 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 Super tough muskie is going to go and eat those super tasty largemouth. Take them too deep. They're going to get hooked deep, and it, it, it's going to eradicate muskie. I mean, I would think. I mean, so. Oh, no, that's why we call them quick strike rigs, Dave. Oh, you okay. set the hook okay. immediately after they hit that bass. And you might be able to save the bass. You never know. So, you know, okay. A little well, wounded, a little, you know, and obviously the eagle would, would not be real. I, I mean, you might have to send in the bass for psychological evaluation. See how he's doing a little, a little period of wellness. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple days off from feeding for wellness, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but, but there could be a survivability of both fish. It might be a win-win. Pete, all I did was a hot take and said your fish wasn't near as tough as it is, and now you're talking about eating our uh, the, the species that I fished for. I mean, there's I'm gonna learn not never to do a hot take with with Pete man. <laughs> again. <laughs> how different? Uh, how different is your game? I mean, I know the answer is very different and and always evolving, but how different is the game of musky fishing today than when you first? made your commitment to be like, this is how I'm going to make my living. That's actually a real interesting question. It's uh, uh, wildly different, frankly. Uh, I would, I would actually include the, the last year as being real interesting with the, with the Canadian border being closed and all of that, especially sunset country, Ontario pressure, all that water up there where people went, well, they're all in the Midwest now. Yeah. Well, fishing because they're not going to stop musky fishing right and and actually there's more anglers than ever so we've had basically uh a hundred percent more pressure on our musky waters uh starting last season and and the other thing that i see is that the average angler is like 10 times better than they used to be obviously with the electronics the mapping and the information out there i mean you don't you don't see too many people that aren't really adept at what they're doing, at least covering the structure and stuff like that. There's obviously different levels of casting and all those different things, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing in that respect, because even, even 10 years ago, but especially like 20 years ago, I mean, for the most part, I'd be out on the water and I was heads and shoulders above 
the other people out there, you you know, and you shouldn't do that, but you kind of watch and laugh and well, they're never going to catch anything. They don't, you know, that's, that's totally different now in all, in all seriousness. And uh, that's why that, you know, back to the topic of why we have the crazy lures and different things. I mean, these, these fish are getting hit where they live. And, and obviously you've got electronics now where a lot of people are going out and searching fish in open water and literally not, even casting until they see a fish uh, has that been has that forward facing sonar deal i mean obviously it's been a huge thing in bass fishing has it been just as big in musky fishing yeah yeah it's it really is amazing and that's that that's one place where uh uh i am trying to catch up but i'm not as good as the young guys and been figuring out a lot of the the great technology that's available out there, but the, the fish literally can't hide anymore. And when you, when you hear of people literally having these setups where they're, they're looking all sides of the boat and they're literally going out in open water and, I, it, and literally somebody's ready to cast, but nobody casts until they spot one. I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy stuff these days. Obviously, for the most part, those fish were never touched 20 years ago. Yeah. Nowhere in a body of water that they can really hide anymore, except obviously it's super thick structure and stuff like that. They can get in there, but they've always been there. We've known that. And that's why, you, you know, you get real aggressive ripping through structure sometimes and that'll, that'll trigger fish. But it's it, the, the game has really changed uh, without a doubt. So how do you think it affects things? Not not just this year. Because everybody's just guessing at this point, but how do you think that technology specifically affects things five years, ten years from now? Well, I I just think we're gonna have to continue to uh, try and come up with different things and different time. I, I again, I don't know to what level yeah. they get educated, but they absolutely do. And and what you can do as well is new baits can be old baits that kind of fell out of favor. You just got to constantly be playing that game. These, these fish, I think we're going to have to keep trying to show them different things in different situations and, and be better at the, that's one of the things I've always preached, I guess, to a certain extent. And I've always felt was my strength. It's certainly probably not reading electronics and some other things, but day-to-day -day patterning yeah. is huge. Uh, and, and I believe that's true with any species, but, you know, especially so with muskies, you know, being the, being the lowest density critter and the top of the line predator, I think they're more apt to, you know, real tight feeding windows, like you've actually seen. And you and I talked about, I know yeah. times and, and, uh, so you've got that you've, you've got trying to dial in the, the intense feeding periods where there are periods where you could probably catch them on a sock still. You know, when they really get fired up and to be able to dial that stuff in and then in the interim to try and find something a little different and figure out that pattern, what they're what they're into. I, you know, I, I've seen some crazy things with regard to a bunch of other baits or bait types that work real yeah. well normally being completely ignored. And there's only, there's only one thing that's working. I think a lot of days you go out there and you just don't find it to a certain extent. But I, I go nuts, Dave. Absolutely darn near crazy fishing on my own. I enjoy it. But I prefer to have at least two other casters. And that's simply because of that. I want to be able to be trying different baits and going through and trying to figure out what it is today these fish are interested in doing. And obviously if you're only one person casting, you can only go one at a time. And that's, that's the part that really, you know, mentally hurts. I, I want other anglers in the boat with me. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is one of the things you've always said. And it, and it is so different than bass fishing because bass fishing, they want to have as little of it. Uh, but, but when you think about it, I mean, there's not as many bass. You take that stretch we fished on in St. Clair. There, there was thousands of bass in that stretch. I mean, in that same stretch, how many muskie do you think there was? Not near as many. I mean, it, <laughs> so so you have to up your odds just simply by having more hammers swinging throughout the day, I guess. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, and uh, yeah, and obviously covering more water to find where the fish and and they do bunch up. That's one thing with, with muskies that uh, I know when I started, I was told they were solitary 
yeah. your fish. And if you, uh, if you wanted another fish to move in on a spot, you needed to catch old Bessie and get her off that spot. But that's, that's definitely not true. And interestingly, it's more so that way with the spotted strains, uh, the Great Lake strain, like Southern St. Clair and, and the Minnesota fish, the Leech Lake strain, they tend to bunch up a little bit more than our Wisconsin strains and, and some of the other places I've been, but they definitely do. So it's a, you know, it's a challenge to a certain extent to find them. In a lot of cases, you could be casting for, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever, and never even have shown yeah. to a muskie. So therefore you can't just write that bait off. Right. Cause it, you, they might not have even been in front of one. So yeah. yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting game from that, that aspect, but uh, yeah, that's uh, it's, it's way more of that now instead of where it used to be just going to good spots and still patterning. Now it's like trying to figure out with each individual lake, what you, you almost want to study what the popular thing to a certain extent on a body of water during a given time. And you want to try that because it still may be working, but you also want to know that for the purpose of trying something exactly different. Basically, yeah. You know, if, if the hot thing has been hot for a while, uh, you know, it, it might be fading. They've seen enough of it. And I've, I've seen so many times where, you know, like 90% of the people on a body of water with social media and everything these days, it gets out that, you know, bait X is working. Well, 90% of the people are throwing bait X sooner or later. That's, that's not going to be a good thing to do. The fish are getting sick. They, you know, they got bruised eagles from being hooked and they're seeing them buzz over their head all the time. And, you know, somewhere along the line, you got to show them something different. Or you're not going to trigger them. Constant change is important. But uh, one of the things that I, that I appreciate most about you, Pete Man, is you're, you're a strange critter. I mean, I love it about you. I've always told you that. Your hair. But the other thing that I love about you, and I don't know if you're still doing it, because because as we said at the beginning, it's been a while since we've actually got to hang out other than giving a high five at iCast or, you know, seeing each other in passing is, and I've told people, this is one of the most amazing things to me, is you wear Velcro shoes. I mean, Velcro was a thing when I was a kid, and 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 I, the last few times that we've been together, you had Velcro shoes on, and, and it's not amazing that you still wear Velcro shoes. It's amazing to me that you find a way to purchase said Velcro shoes when nobody wears <laughs> Velcro shoes anymore. Are you still embracing the Velcro, and are you waiting for it to come back? I it's hard to find velcro shoes it really is, very huh? sad uh i i will say that i'm totally still in the ease mode i yeah. hate hate shoelaces that is an absolute waste of time and then after you go through all the trouble of tying them sometimes they come untied total waste of time you could be casting you're probably missing three four casts if you got to bend down and do something like that and it's absolutely ridiculous waste of time so i i try i mainly sandals these days okay in the summertime and i i usually have a spare pair in case you know they, they actually break uh so but they're quick and they're they're slip on and, and now uh with the velcro being hard to find i generally just like have pull-on boots yeah fall you know that i don't have to mess with you just slide the feet in you're good to go uh, sometimes they're a little clumsy on the trolling motor pedal, but it is what it is. You got to keep the tootsies warm, right? <laughs> Does it shock you that Velcro did not hang out longer than it did? I, I mean, really, when you think about it, you make a great case for Velcro. I, I do. I, I, I mean, the shoes were, yeah, that's ridiculous that there's not more Velcro with the shoes. Now it's overused to a certain extent on some rain gear. Yeah. Have you ever, yeah, I mean, you can get all tangled up, but sometimes I'm moving, you know, you get the Velcro, I actually grab the mullet and it's cool. that's good. I mean, you know, it's like you get all locked up, but, uh, but for shoes and boots, I mean, it, it should come back. Maybe would you like to be a partner by the way, since you're a Canadian and, and maybe we could take over the North American continent with a series of, uh, Velcro shoes and boots. I mean, I'm, i Listen, if if I haven't proved anything with my my somewhat successful career, I'll promote any piece of crap. If there's <laughs> a, 
No, but I mean, I'm all in. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm uh, another reason. I mean, I, I don't find it. Um, I don't find it uh, troublesome to tie knots and that sort of thing. Those don't bother me, but I'm a, I'm a little top heavy and, and bending over is hard. Velcro, you could just kick clothes with your foot. So I'm a big fan of, yes. of Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, if you look you up um, on Wikipedia, and I actually did this right before uh, we did this, and I'm like, I've known this guy forever. He's a good buddy, but but I better look and see what people say about him professionally. But if, if you look through the list, uh, you, you uh, an author, uh, uh, used to own a magazine, you know, have hosted multiple shows, you know, competed for, you know, caught giant muskies. What do you want people to remember you as? What, oh, and, and more important, don't ask me, because who cares how people remember you? Let's be honest, in real life, nobody really remembers you. It's just life <laughs> goes on. So what 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 evolution of Pete Mena are you proudest of? Well, I, I actually got to say the, the conservation end of it, really. Uh, yeah. More than anything, you know, I mean, anybody can go out and get them if you're hard-headed enough, I guess, to catch them. But uh you know, I feel like that's something that, uh, you know, is, is obviously important with more and more people out there being good at it. Uh, you know, the, the handling, the handling aspects and, and protecting the fishery. The reality is we all know that. I mean, uh, the companies that we represent, uh, you know, we're all wherever the gray line is, but eventually if the, you know, if there aren't enough fish, if the bobbers aren't sinking, we're out of business yeah. at the end of the day. And, and the other truth is realistically, what do, what do guys like us do that are doing this, this for a living? We're, we're trying to find the healthiest fisheries also, hopefully not real heavily fished, <laughs> but, but in, yeah, that, that's what you're looking for, right? You know, in places where there's a lot of what you're fishing for and hopefully bigger ones. And, and the handling aspect you mentioned earlier that the, you know, muskies are kind of wimps when it comes to handling and they, they really are to a certain extent compared to a lot of species. They're very susceptible to stress, especially in hot water. So just getting out the message on that. And, and sometimes that's a bumpy road, uh, you know, which, which kind of sucks to a certain extent. Oh, Pete, you know, I like to do that. I like to hold them this way. I like to do this, I, you know. But at the end of the day, there's no sense releasing them if they're going to die. And uh, I want to catch them again, selfishly. So that's something that, uh, you know, uh, like 25 years ago, some of the conservation handling type stuff was uh, transferred to different languages overseas. I'm, I'm more proud of that probably than anything and still trying to keep the message going out there, you know. Yeah, it is amazing. And, and you're right. Um, the, that summer thing and the warm water fishing, that causes a lot of different, you know, people's opinions and that sort of thing. And musky fishing in general, really, one thing I've learned, um, you, I don't know that I can hold a musky right and put it on any social media platform and not get yelled at. Oh, you'll um, probably get yelled at, yeah. yeah. yeah there's <laughs> it doesn't matter how you hold it. I mean, and even if you hold it perfectly, somebody's going to say, well, you shouldn't even have taken it out of the water. So while I have you here, Pete, man, give me one-on-one. Let's spread that message right now. Well, how do you properly hold a muskie and give me your theory on summer fishing? And then, and then I, I'm, I'm done talking about muskie. Uh, 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 it's enough muskie. Uh, very, very simply, the try and support the whole body of the fish. Generally, generally horizontal is, uh, is the way to go rather than a vertical type hold. Then the other important thing I was, you know, they don't always cooperate. Obviously no fish does. Some want to shake. And so I would say point them, be at, be at the edge of the boat and point them towards the water in case they do start shaking. It, it looks a little ugly, but that way you can basically just pitch them in the water and they're a lot better off. Yeah. In that situation. And with regard to the heat thing, I, I like to tell people just, uh, you know, back when I was fishing with Tex and Bob, we're trying to keep some fish alive and alive well. And all of a sudden we got this huge hot spell. You can tell it's all fish. It's not just muskies. When the water's warm, boy, you, you know, you got X amount of fish in there. When the water temperature is 60 degrees that you're pumping in, all of a sudden it's now 75 or something like that. You need to 
have a lot more oxygen in there and be pumping water. So you can you you can see the stress level just in a you know a basic situation like that. But with muskies, once it gets up in the mid 70s, you really got to minimize the time out of the water. And and frankly, overall, I suggest to people, I'm not going to tell anybody what they have to do. But if it is get in a weird situation where the top level of the water is baked up to 80 degrees or so, I suggest not fishing for them at all because there's a good chance that uh, it's, that's a good time to go bass fishing. That, that's when you go bass fishing. They're, they okay. are tougher. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, that's, yeah, that's I know. Don't, I don't even, them. don't even say it. This is a serious topic, Dave. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know. Our fish we, is better I didn't know we were doing serious, Pete. Yeah, no, no, we wouldn't. But, but yeah, that's uh, that's my thoughts, Dave. It was interesting, by the way, on how things changed because about twenty uh, some years ago, I was the guy that started. We all did it, including me. The big deal was vertical holds with muskies because you could kind of like hold oh, them out yeah. farther and make them look bigger. So a lot of us professionals were doing that. And uh, I was the one that kind of started saying maybe we shouldn't be doing that. And my name was Mud for about two years. But now, if you go on social media and post a pic, I kind of laugh about this every once in a while. Some, some poor slob that just happens to put a, a muskie up with a vertical hold or a semi-vertical hold just absolutely gets slaughtered. So those of you watching right now who who are on social media and, and expect trouble from the, the musky Nazis. If you put a vertical hold up there, you really, <laughs> you really don't want to do that. I, in reality, uh, if it's, if it's super quick, a couple of seconds, I, I really don't know that it's the end of the world. It's probably overrated to a certain extent. It's more of the time out of the water and the length of the hold. That's really more important than anything. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's sure gotten to be a no, no on social these days. Yeah. Yeah. People, I mean, a lot, most things are a no, no. I mean, let's be honest. Somebody's going to comment about this and, and complain. Yeah. I mean, people, people like to be heard and yeah. <laughs> social media is a great way for them to be heard. But Pete, uh, I, I thank you for doing this and I, and I, it's, it's great to catch up with you. I, I still don't understand uh, why you are addicted to, to musky, but I appreciate it. And I'm thankful we have educators and people like you in our industry, because you truly have made musky fishing better for, for, for countless people. Um, you know, I, I can't even put a number on it because I mean, you've helped people catch muskies all, all across the world. And, and I thank you for that. Well, thank you. And it was really good to catch up. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's do it next time uh, uh, with some drinks. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I, I like me better that way. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get drunk and go live. There you, All go. Right. There you go. Let us know in comments who wants to see the drunk one on one. With me and Pete Mena. This has been Pete Mena. I thank you for your time. But what are you doing the rest of the day? What what does Pete Mena do after this interview? Uh, Pete Mena is watching the weather and most likely going to go out midday because we're supposed to have a few storms rolling through. That's a good time to catch a muskie. All right. All right, Pete, I'm going to challenge you this because you threw it out there. And in the past, we've had several guests that said, I'm leaving right now and I'm going fishing. Uh, I want a one minute little short video, whether you catch them or don't catch them. I, I need an update on how it worked out to finish this, uh, this number one rated podcast on this particular channel. Can you do that? Okay. I'll see. I might not be able to do it. It might be me talking for a minute. That's fine. That's I fine. I'd find I mean, they've listened to you talk for a lot of minutes now. So why, well, why not another minute? That's another minute, right? Yeah. Pete man. Thank you very much. Good luck fishing. And Stay tuned to the end of this to find out if Pete Mana caught him or didn't. So there you have it. One thing clear, from, well, a few things clear from that interview. Pete Mana, an awesome dude. We all should be thankful for him in the musky world. And I'm only doing this until our Velcro Emporium takes off. Pete and Dave's Velcro Emporium, where finally the Velcro shoe returns to its rightful place on your foot. If you'd like to invest in our Velcro shoe business, let us know. 
But speaking of investing, thank you for investing a little time here with the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that is Mercer. Week after week, we bring you different guests. We talk about weirdness and surprisingly, you guys listen. Thank you for that. Drop a like. Have a great week. Make somebody's week a better, better. Make the world a better place for somebody. One person. Pick one person. Do something really kind and really nice for them. And, and if I'm that person, here's what I'd like you to do. Just drop a like and subscribe. Mercer, out. Nah, that wasn't near as cool as in my head. It was like, <laughs> Mercer. Uh, I'll see you next week. Stay Tune to the end to see if Pete actually caught any fish. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmaster told you to. You hear? Do you mind? There we go. Okay. Dave Mercer, this is for you. Right down here is a nice little muskie. He's about a, I don't know, 34 inch, 33 inch muskie. And that's for you, man. You asked about our fishing trip, and well, there he is. Uh, by the way, because we get the count follows, we had two other follows. One might have been this fish, and I missed another nice one. And we caught about three pipes. So that's our report, Dave. Thanks, man.